So you see that with just one single track, you can already do some very interesting things. But for other shots, just one point is not enough. So for example, if you have a shot like this, with the camera moving around, well, it's not really a movement, it's more like, well, panning around, then just tracking one marker is not enough. So for example, if you want to put some mountains here in the background, then just tracking one point, for example, this one here, would be not enough. Because in the case that the camera is rotating on its own axis, you know, like that, then the rotation of the whole scene, or of the horizon in this case, would not be tracked. So somehow you have to take care of that. And for that you can do a very simple two-point tracking. So let's just try. So back in Blender, of course, we go to the movie clip editor, then click on open, and then go to the folder with your footage. So in this case, it is two-point track, and there is one video named Leipzig Skyline. So just select that, open clip, and there you go. So just let it cache into the RAM. And when it has reached the end frame, which is uh, 147, just go to the timeline and press E. Um, so let me zoom out and go full screen with shift spacebar and then analyze the footage. So as you can see, we have a movement that is not just linear from left to right, like that. The camera is also shaking and rotating a little bit in this direction. So the horizon is first like that, if you exaggerate a bit, and then some frames later it is like that. And of course we have to take care of that. So uh, for that we would do a two-point tracking. And we cannot just pick any two points, we have to think about which points we want to use. So it would not make sense to add a marker here and another marker here because between these two markers there is not very much information about the rotation. But if you track, for example, this point and that one, or this one and that one, then the angle of rotation between these two points is much bigger and the more information you have, the better it will be. So now let's see if these two points are visible all the time. So we are at the last frame here, and if I go forward, then this is still visible. But as you can see, the feature that I had picked before leaves the frame rather early here on frame uh, 50. So in that case, maybe we want to pick something that is a little bit closer or that is uh, visible longer. So it could be this corner here or that point here. Maybe we can just pick this one. And I want to add the marker now, but instead of using this button here, we can use a faster method, and that is to use a shortcut, which is to hold down the control key and then just left click on the point where you want to add the marker. So control left click here, and that will add the marker. And you can now let go the control key. And if you hold down the left mouse button, then now you can slide the marker and as soon as you let go the left mouse button, it will then be placed here. Now we are zoomed out, so the movements are pretty fast and big here with your left mouse button. So as long as you hold down the left mouse button, you can also go into the precision mode, which you can do by holding down the shift key. So now if I also hold down the shift key, I can make bigger movements with my mouse, but have very precise um, result here on the movement of the marker. So now we can very easily place that here. Let go the left mouse button and the shift key. And now we have that marker here. Okay, maybe let's just track that before we do anything else. So we could try to do that automatically or frame by frame. Well, and it seems that automatic tracking went pretty fine here. So if you scrub through the shot, then you can see that it really stays there and is very nice and stable. So that marker is ready and finished, so we can just leave it alone. Now on the last frame, I had also added these two markers, but just so that we don't confuse ourselves, let's delete these markers. 
Okay, maybe go back to frame one and add the second marker. So hold down the control key and then left mouse button click, hold down the left mouse button, let go the control key and then go into precision mode by now holding down the shift key. And then place that here on this point, let go and then press track forward or use the shortcut control T or in my case it would be command T, but the official shortcut is control T. Okay, so that was pretty nice, went fine. So now we can create the empties from these two tracks. Maybe let's go to the reconstruction mode by hitting the tab key or by using the menu down here, reconstruction. And here you can see the button link empty to track, which is of course the same as if you would go to reconstruction and choose that from here. Okay, link empty to track for the first marker and also for the second marker. All right, so shift spacebar to leave full screen and now we can switch to the 3D viewport. So go here, 3D view, and you can see we have these two empties here. But just as before, we have now the camera here rotated in 3D space. So let's clear that by selecting the camera and hitting Alt R, Alt G, and then G, Z, 5 to move the camera five blender units along the z-axis. I mean, you can also just uh, move one blender unit or 10, whatever you like, just so that the camera is maybe not on the floor. Because if the camera is here on the floor, then you would have to deal with very, very small numbers like that. So you can also see that the empties are always in relation to the camera, which is really, really nice. So. Just use whatever you want to and then press zero to look through the camera. Okay, then N for the sidebar, go to background images, add image, camera, movie clip, choose the movie clip and there you go. So now we have these two markers on our points. Maybe I can quickly show you how these constraints look like. So if I select this empty here, and then go to the constraints panel, which you can find here in the properties. Then you can see this follow track constraint and it has assigned the movie clip, the camera object and the name of the track. So if you would want to assign this constraint to a new empty, then you could select that empty and then go to add constraint, then here follow track and then just fill in this data here. And now the challenge is to attach an image to these points. And to make our lives easier, we can use an add-on for that. So just to get around the usual procedure to create a material texture and so on, we can use the add-on import images as planes. So first let's go to the user preferences and then search for image and then choose here, import export, import images as planes. So. Now we can go to file and then import and then here choose images as planes. When you click that, you will go to the file browser and then go to the texture folder and choose the image mountains.png. And before you import that, you can also enable some settings here. So down below here in the import images as planes properties, you can go to the material mappings, enable shadeless use alpha and pre-multiply. And then you can click this button here. And if you now go to the textured view, you can see these mountains here. So, okay, we've got that, but now we have to attach this image to these points. So just press G to move the image up here so that you can match the horizon line, maybe like so. But when you now hit S to scale it up, then you will lose the matching of the horizon line. So before we start doing that, uh, we can make some little adjustments here to our image. For example, we can move the image up so that the horizon line uh, matches up with the origin of this object. And to do that, you can go to edit mode by hitting the tab key and then move it up so that the origin point, the pivot point of this object matches with the horizon line. And then press tab key again 
to leave the edit mode, then move it back down so that it matches with the horizon. And if you now hit S, then you can scale it and you will still have the horizon line, like so. Okay, but if you now hit Alt A, then of course the image doesn't stick to this empty. So first we might try to parent that. So shift right click select the empty and hit Ctrl P, set parent to object. And it seems to work, but if you look closely here, then you can see some clearly visible sliding. And this sliding happens because the camera is also rotating a little bit like that. So we would have to somehow match the rotation. And to do that, we can make use of the second point. And for that, we need to create a constraint. But instead of adding the constraint directly to the image, I want to use a trick and that is to use an armature for that or bones. Because we might not just want to use this one single image. Maybe there can be more images, maybe some additional buildings here. And for that it would be cool if we would have this helper object that we can parent our uh, images to so that we don't have to parent images to image and so on. So first I select the plane again and then hit Alt P clear parent, then select the empty, hit shift S3 to make sure that the cursor is here on this empty. And then here hit shift A and add an armature, a single bone like so. You can see the bone right here. And now select the tip of the bone by going to edit mode and selecting that and move it over here. Now, of course, it has to be exactly on this empty. So first I hit the tab key again to leave edit mode, then select this empty, hit shift S3 again to make the cursor here, then select armature and then hit shift S2 to make the tip of the bone go to this empty. All right, Alt A, still nothing's happening, but now we can parent the armature to this empty. So select the armature, then select this empty, then hit Control P, set parent to object. Okay, so that works. But now still the armature is not really pointing to this single point here. So there is some sliding. And to fix that, I want to use a constraint. So first I select the armature, then go to pose mode, either by using the menu here or by hitting the shortcut Control Tab key. Now I'm in pose mode and then I select the empty, then shift select the bone in pose mode and then add the constraint by hitting control shift C and then use the stretch to constraint. And now the bone will stretch to this point. So that will always exactly fit. And now we can parent the image to this bone. Control P and don't parent it to the object, parent it really to the bone. Because then by parenting, the image will also inherit the stretching of this bone or the scale. And that can be important if you have lenses with a very bad lens distortion, because then when the marker comes near to the border of your image, then because of the lens distortion, you might have some stretching between these two points. And if you then use the stretch to constraint, you can automatically also scale your image. But anyway, this should now work. And here you can see how the image also rotates with the bone. So now it's just a matter of lining it up. So I go to frame one and maybe have a look at the movement here. So, okay, maybe let's go to the last frame and then make sure just by moving the object that the image here is on the border like so then go to frame one okay and obviously it is not big enough so we can just scale it up a little bit move it back and then make sure that the image is always here filling up the whole frame like so then maybe look at that in the textured viewport shading and just so that we don't get confused we can also move this whole rig, the two empties, the armature to layer two by hitting M and then two or just clicking on this layer here and then Alt A to playback and the mountains are sticking nicely to the horizon line. 
So our tracking here is finished and the rest is just compositing. So maybe let's just to complete that, maybe let's just do that. So um, this should render fine already when you press F12. There you've got your horizon. Maybe we can change the background color to black. Or actually, let's not uh, change the background color. Let's go to shading and then enable pre-multiplied because that will not render the sky. It will multiply against the black background. So here we have our nice alpha channel and we can go right away to the compositor by hitting control left arrow, enable use notes, backdrop, just use the standard procedure here, shift A, add input movie clip, choose the movie clip, then shift A, distort, scale and render size, connect these two, add the viewer node by hitting shift A, output, and then choose the viewer node. So these steps you can always do right away when you're doing uh, tracking and compositing. So this is always very handy. You always need the viewer node. So now we can try to move our mountains here, our background over the movie clip. So shift A, add color and then alpha over because we want to over this image by making use of the alpha channel. So that will be the background. That's why it comes into the first image input. Then our render layer comes into the second input here and then control shift left click on the alpha over node to view that. And it looks already quite nice. Now, of course, something that looks totally weird is that the uh, buildings here are disappearing uh, behind the mountains. So somehow we have to take care of that. And to do that, we will do some simple keying. So control shift click on your movie clip or on the scale node actually. Of course, we don't have any green or blue or red color here, so we cannot key the color, but this is very bright and this is not so bright. So what we can do is to key the brightness or the luminance. So what we need is a luma keyer and you will find the luma key in the mat nodes. And there you can find the luminance key. Just drag it here on this line or connect it manually and then look not at the image but at the mat. So control shift click once and twice so that the viewer node is connected to the mat. And since we don't need the image output of the luminance key at all, I want to hide that output by hitting control H because control H will hide any unused inputs or outputs of nodes. Okay, so we've got that. Now we have to increase the low contrast here. So increase that until everything here is a nice solid black color, but not too harsh so that you don't lose any detail here. And now we have to turn down the high contrast so that this becomes a nice bright color here maybe like so that should be enough i think and now we have to somehow use this key and we can do that by multiplying this output this black and white color image over the alpha channel of the render layer because if you look at the alpha channel of this layer it is black down here and then you have this transition this gradient here so if you take this and multiply that over that then you will just cut out these black buildings here. And speaking of cutting, let's also cut this because we don't need that at the moment. So hold down the control key and then left click and drag to cut this line. We will connect it later, but now we don't have this line in the way. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention yet, I'm using the straight lines here and chances are that you have curved lines. And that is a setting in the user preferences so in the themes, in the node editor, you can set the noodle curving and the default setting is five. So that is probably what you are seeing, but I like the straight lines better. So I've set the noodle curving to zero. Okay, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just a person preference. Okay, but now we have to multiply this with the alpha channel. 
and multiplying. You can do that with the mix node or with math. When you have a black and white image, then you can also use the math node. So we can put the input of the mat inside of the first input here, then bring the alpha channel here in this and then set it to multiply. And if you look at that, now you have basically the combination of the luminance key and the alpha channel, like so. All right, but now what can we do with that? Well, we have to replace the alpha channel of this render layer, because currently the transparency for this render layer is here, set by the alpha channel. And this is, as we know, the wrong alpha channel, because we have to cut out the buildings. So that is what we did here. So we just have to replace this alpha channel right here with our newly created alpha channel right here. Maybe we can collapse that so that it doesn't get in the way that much. Maybe like so. Okay, replacing an alpha channel, we have a node for that. So Shift A and then here in the converter menu, you can use the set alpha node Drag that on your line so that the image goes inside of the image input of the set alpha. And now we can here replace the alpha value with our custom alpha channel, like so. And when you look at this in the alpha over node, suddenly it looks kind of weird. But if you now enable this button here, convert pre-multiplied, then it still is not perfect, but at least you have cut out the buildings. So you see this little white line around the buildings. That is something caused by this luminance key. So there is some areas that is not perfect, but you can uh, try to uh, try to fix that by using the delayed erode node. And you can find that in filter. So in the filter menu, you can set this to delayed and erode. And when you drag this, behind the luminance key, like so. Then when you increase the distance, you can take away something of this white line. But the problem is now we have some artifacts here and I guess we do have to increase the brightness here in the luminance key a little bit more because that gives us artifacts. So expand the luminance key and turn down the high value a little bit more until this is now a solid white color. Like so, that's a bit better. I think that's fine. Okay, so that looks kind of nice, but what I don't like is that this hazy area here um, is looking so gray, but the background is kind of blue. So what I want to do now is to match the color of our hazy background, this misty area here in the background of the uh, of the original footage here, that one, I want to match that to the blue color of our mountains here. All right, now I zoom out a little bit. That this doesn't get in the way. And first of all, I want to increase the blue values for this area. So to do that, um, maybe we can just use a mix node drag this on this line like so and then set this to color because with color we can colorize this area. So control shift click on the color node like so. Now it is black and white. But now we can in the second input here we can make this bluish and that way we can give the whole thing um, a slight bluish tint. But of course, I don't want to give this tint to the rest of the image, just to this area. Now, luckily, we already have a key for that. So if you look at that, that might work to limit this to just that area. So if I bring that up into the factor input of the color node, then all of a sudden we have just a blue background. Maybe it's not such a nice color yet. Maybe like so, I don't know. Let's have a look at the result. Yeah, that starts to look better. The bluer it gets, the better is the transition here. So, well, that is pretty nice, but still not perfect, of course. 
We might be able to enhance that with a soften filter. So shift A, filter. This is already set to soften. So if you drag this in here, then the mountains are not as sharp anymore. Maybe set this to 50% like so. Okay. And now we can add some color correction for the final result. All right, and that's looking pretty fine, I think. So now let's see how that looks like when we render that. So don't forget to connect the RGB curves to the composite output. Then set the resolution to 720p. Also set the correct frame rate and then just render it as a PNG sequence. So I save the file and then just use my custom output here, slash slash render, and then start rendering that. And then when it's finished, go to the video sequence editor, hit shift A, add images, and then in the render folder, just hit A to select everything, set the start frame to one, and then add image strip, and there you go. There's the image sequence. There might be some flickering here, but then it's just a rather bad key. So we might want to add more attention to that, but the tracking itself looks really solid. Okay, so that's what you can do with two point tracking in Blender's constraint system. In the future, there might be ways to add the tracks directly to the compositor, but for now, you just have to go the way over the 3D viewport and the constraints.